My name is Leila, uh, ex-UNICEF staff, I'm not working currently. Ben, you refer to the fact that we, you know, you guys entered uh, Syria with the old toolkit of humanitarian assistance. And that's one of the reasons why, um, in a way, we failed in Syria. And then, um, Matthew referred to the need for innovation in delivering humanitarian assistance. And I'm wondering, is there any appetite and any room for um, innovation in this sector altogether? Because the cost of failure is too high on two fronts. Uh, one, you're dealing with human life. And two, you're dealing with donors who are very um, conservative. You know, the first time that you fail, as long as you can blame your failure on lack of access, that's fine. But if you, if you fail because you came up with a new idea or a new way of doing things, that might cost you a lot um, later on. I thought, if, you know, if you have anything to say on that. Thank you. Ben, do you want to start? Uh, uh, yeah, I'll try and I'll try and be quick. Uh, great, great question. Um, the old, well, in fact, we were using the old toolkit, but also some of the new toolkit after Haiti. The uh, those of you who are humanitarian policy wonks, I suspect that's a frightening proportion of you. You will have heard of the uh, uh, IASC and the transformative agenda and the concept of level three. All these uh, uh, mechanisms are gradually uh, cranked into action without really changing much at all. I think uh, those of you who, who follow this, the Interagency Standing Committee is still an exclusive club. It doesn't include the people who pay the bills. It's Western dominated. It, uh, it doesn't uh, uh, have really a significant local civil society or NGO representation and is, is uh, very much a creature of the past. And its reform has been uh, uh, anything but revolutionary. So um, sadly, I felt that the, the new bits of the old toolkit uh, didn't really perform. Um, I think our problem uh, with the donors is uh, uh, reflected in the government's problems with their parliaments and their taxpayers. And I, I apologize if my colleague from DFID felt I was targeting him, but we suffered and my colleagues uh, confirmed it to me last night, we suffer from being asked to prove the impossible uh, in terms of um, uh, reporting and access and fairness and neutrality and quality and creativity and lack of diversion. Um, because in a way, the public and the media are, are very harsh when, when things go wrong. So I think um, the donor agencies of, of uh, states are often forced into being uh, rather rather harsh. But I think there was another uh, problem in Syria was that in a way the Syrian government was right. You know, the people who were paying the aid bill, frankly, wouldn't have minded at all if the regime was changed. And um, it, it really was, was plain, as plain as your face that that was the state of affairs. So um, I think uh, innovation has, you know, the, the humanitarian system has found yeah, a very good at, uh, found itself very good at co-opting new ideas, and now innovation is one of our buzz phrases almost uh, as much as resilience. So I think true innovation would be much more scary. I think it would remove the brands and the banners that Mawa was re referring to, and I don't see uh, that happening. On the other hand, final point, my, my colleagues uh, and uh, uh, brothers and sisters in the humanitarian operation in Syria were doing really uh, risky, creative, uh, and unusual things to make it happen, and many of them cannot be described in public um, for their own safety and the, the, the continuation of the, of the operation. To you, Matthew. Thank you. Thank you very much. I agree. I think it's a, fan I think it's a really fantastic question. Um, well, two questions, weren't there, really? Um, one was, is there room for innovation? I think the answer has to be, yes, there is. I think there are much more imaginative ways. For example, we can try and use cash. Cash is quite easy to get across borders and barriers and so on, much more easy than medical supplies or food. So now, it w there will be cases where, of course, if there is no food, there are no medical supplies, then cash may not be, be the solution, but there are, t there are times where, where cash may well be a solution if, if markets are working to some, some extent. I think we can be more innovative there, and that's just, just one example. But I, but I do take the point that um, uh, both Leila and, and Ben made about the question of 
um, well, what is the appetite for risk of donors? I think that's a really well taken point. We have to really consider that. It is a difficult one. It is a difficult one because, you know, if there are examples where um, assistance is found to have been diverted to extremist groups and possibly therefore, you know, to terrorist groups and so on, that is very, very difficult for donors. It's very, very difficult for parliaments and very, very difficult for taxpayers. So there are all sorts of reasons why uh, uh, the, you know, there is a, an incentive for us to be conservative. I think that we have to challenge ourselves. We, ha we and my, me as a civil servant, we have to challenge our ministers to see exactly what the appetite for risk is and accept that in a situation where the needs are so desperate, we have to take risks that perhaps we might not be comfortable with elsewhere. But it's, there's no easy answer to that one. Thank you very much. More questions? Yes, please. Amir Paivar, Amir Paivar, BBC Persian Service. Uh, we constantly hear about Iranian military being active, more precisely Revolutionary Guards in Syrian conflict. I cannot help but think whether anyone in the panel has knowledge of Iranian aid agencies being equally active in the conflict. First question. That's uh, Iranian Red Crescent or ag aid agencies which are based in Lebanon, like uh, Imam Khomeini Aid Agency or Martyrs Foundation. And the second question is whether any any of the uh, entities present here have ever tried to establish a communication line with those agencies and work with them, or are they perceived to be too politicized or entrenched with the Iranian state and the level of mistrust uh, tackles that? Thank you very that. much. We'll, we'll take uh, two more questions and then uh, I'll leave it to you to, to, to answer, please. Um, yeah, please here. Thank you. And then to the lady. <laughs> Tahir Zaman, uh, independent researcher. Uh, this is just a quick question for Matthew, given, um, uh, given um, Ben's considered opinion that amateurs uh, are doing a better job than professionals. Is Diffid not just backing the wrong horses when you talk about um, a matching appeal and working with the likes of Save the Children, uh, World Child and so on? These are large professional organisations. Would you not be better served and would my, my tax money be not, better, uh, be not better served by working with the likes of diaspora groups such as Marwas? Thank you. And a final question from you, please. Um, Rebecca Crozier from International Alert, the peacebuilding organization. Um, my question is about, we've, we've talked a lot about um, the need to gain uh, access. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about the kind of need to, to, to kind of maintain and protect the access that we already have. Uh, in particular, we, we work in Lebanon and, and we're kind of increasingly concerned about the response of, of local communities there that are hosting refugees who are increasingly actually blocking and, and obstructing the activities of um, international and local organisations that are seeking to provide support to refugees, um, and that you know they're doing this because there's a belief that um, that support is being provided at the extent at the expense of host communities. Host communities are not benefiting um, from a lot of money that's going into um, um, refugee activity. Um, um, it's, it's kind of a question about the conflict sensitivity of aid. Um, I think you know the, there is a lot of, of lot of money being spent in places like Lebanon. If it's not spent well, um, then we risk actually undermining and, and limiting the amount of space that we have to operate already. Um, so it's a question as to you know are we doing enough to maintain space? Are we doing enough to make sure that the, the um, conflict sensitivity of aid is 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 there? Thank you. M uh, Sean, maybe you want to uh, start by answering some of these questions, please. Um, well, I can give you short answers um, um, because I, 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 you know, certainly the first one, I just don't know. I really just don't know. Uh, it's an interesting question, though. Uh, it's one I'll follow up with my colleagues in Damascus and, and um, you know, we can be in touch and I'll let you know what I find out. Um, uh, I think it's an intriguing question. Are the amateurs doing better than the professionals? Um, are we backing the wrong horse? Um, I think there's a complementarity there. Um, I think, you know, the 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 you know local grassroots initiatives are f absolutely fantastic. They're vital, 
um, but the challenge, you know, and, and, uh, but it's complementary to to the sort of bigger pipelines. It, there's a there's a challenge around scale. How do you how you you can't scale up that grassroots um, assistance very effectively um, in a fractured state, um, and 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 particularly in in in, in opposition held areas where where you know there's a myriad of different groups, um, you know, vying for control. Um, you know, it's very different, difficult to, to put anything in that's systematic um, and, that, and that's scalable. But I'd be interested to hear what the others have to say on, on that. And I'm afraid, um, Rebecca, I, I have no idea how to answer your question. So I'm going to leave it to someone else. <laughs> Matthew? Right. <laughs> well, I'm afraid I also have no idea how to answer the first question. So my apologies. I, I don't know the answer to that one either. Um, on the... Uh, Tahir, Tahir, was it? Tahir? Uh, uh, on your question about um, are we backing the wrong horses if we're supporting um, established uh, professional uh, organisations, I think the answer is no, because some of them are doing, well, many of them are doing absolutely fantastic work, and not only doing fantastic work, but we've also heard about the bravery and the cost that has been paid in terms of, of people's lives and so on. So uh, I think we're backing the right horses. I mean, the ones I mentioned... Save the Children Fund, Oxfam, UNICEF are all doing fantastic work. I guess for me, perhaps the question is, are there other right horses that we should be backing too? And I think that's a really fair challenge to us. I certainly endorse Sean's point that, you know, if we're going to kind of reach the numbers of people that we need to reach and the scale at the scale and the regularity we need to reach, then we have to get use organisations that have the ability to deliver at scale. But there are also fantastic organisations working on the ground that could really do with the support and really use it well. It's a challenge to an organisation like mine, as it probably is to some of the others here, to actually find those organisations and provide exactly the right kind of support. Um, but uh, I think it's a very welcome challenge. So are there other right organisations that we should support? Quite possibly, yes. And then Rebecca's question, actually, I, I think I, I tried to touch on that issue a little bit in, one of, in something I said a bit earlier, but I think you're absolutely right. I mean, Lebanon at the moment has got something like 870,000 <coughs> refugees officially in a population of 4 million. So that is an absolutely massive, massive uh, strain on uh, Lebanon itself. And as you rightly say, you know, there have been examples where there is tension, where there is even sometimes a spilled into conflict. I think that there is something that we in the international community can try and do about that and that is to make sure that we don't just we don't as i said before see refugees and host communities as very separate they're people living in a shared space in really very difficult uh, circumstances and we've got to make sure that you know our assistance is going to all those who need it we're trying to do that and trying to develop some new ways of doing that um, in DFID. We've just appointed actually development representatives in both Lebanon and Jordan where we haven't traditionally had aid programs um, to try and look at a more kind of coherent country approach to, to our work in those countries and to try and find ways of working with local organisations, local systems, um, you know, official systems, be it municipalities, ministries of education, ministries of health, to ensure that the kind of assistance is provided to everybody to try and reduce the kind of tensions that you spoke about. But it's really, really important that we get this right. Otherwise, you know, we can be in a position where uh, more harm is done than good. Ben, maybe you can uh, uh, comment on the issue of Iranian organizations trying to help. Uh, you have been in Damascus. We know that Iran is involved and in backing the government on a political and military level, but are they on a humanitarian level? Have you been approached by any Iranian organizations inside Syria? Uh, no, but there were some. All I have, all I can remember is some deliveries by the Iranian Red Crescent, which. Um, uh, we didn't really get much detail on. Um, so I'm afraid I, I'm also not very helpful on that one. Okay, thank you. Maybe we take uh, three more questions there. Yes, sir, please. If you introduce yourself. Microphone? Stand, yeah. Yes, um, my name's Martin Barber. I'm a former UN official. Uh, hi, Ben. Uh, nice to hear you and um, excellent uh, remarks. Um, I think as somebody who's been um, taking part in humanitarian operations for, for several decades, the most extraordinary and shocking 
aspect of the uh, situation in Syria has been the, the targeting of health facilities by military force. And um, I, I don't want to put our speakers too much on the spot, but uh, I mean, it does occur to me that um, the ICRC is both an aid agency and the custodian of the Geneva Conventions. And these attacks are quite clearly sort of egregious breaches of the Geneva Conventions and, and constitute war crimes. And do you feel that the ICRC is in some ways constrained by its role as a relief organization from playing perhaps as full a role as custodian of the Geneva Conventions as might be warranted by the extraordinary and, and, and shocking nature of these attacks. Thank you, Sean. We'll, we'll, uh, Sean, we'll get back to you, but we'll have two more questions, please. Um, yes, please, the gentleman in the middle and then the lady in the back, please. Hi, uh, Chris Swallow, Stabilization Advisor. Given we're seeing more situations where the amount of factions is very relevant, Libya, for instance, do you think the international community in humanitarian situations possesses the toolkits to deal with that, especially looking at the oppositions in a lot of these situations? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Anita Williams from Tear Fund. I had the privilege of speaking to Syrian lawyers and doctors working underground in Jordan and was privileged to be there when you, uh, ICRC and OCHA and civil society launched the standard operating procedures to address child protection and gender-based violence. I was wondering if the panel could uh, talk a little bit about the, that issue within Syria and what efforts has the humanitarian agencies taken to reduce the, the levels of violence against women and children. Maybe we hear from you, Yeah, well. just, just, just very quickly, I think, on this question about uh, violence against women and girls and so on. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, we, as, as uh, I think Ben and others have mentioned, you know, we may not know the full extent of, uh, of what is happening in Syria in some of the refugee camps or the informal settlements, but we know that the, the level of sexual violence and gender-based violence is extremely high and, uh, it, and it needs to be a real priority for us. Um, it is, for the British government, an extremely high priority and it's something that we are expanding our, our work on, both in Syria and elsewhere. I don't know, some of you may not know this, but on the 13th of November, uh, <laughs> Justin Greening, who's the DFID Secretary of State, uh, convened and co-chaired a high-level meeting here in London, specifically looking at the question of sexual violence and sexual exploitation in emergency situations, and she announced, I think it was a total of almost £22 million of support for organisations that we're working with to try and reduce that, and of that, about £10 million is for organisations such as the United Nations Population Fund and others working in Syria or in the, in the, uh, in the uh, countries where the Syrian refugees are uh, to tackle this through providing counselling for women and girls who have suffered sexual violence, providing advice um, and various other services to women. So I think it is an extremely important thing. I don't think, frankly, that we're doing enough about it. We're still not doing enough collectively. And I think we, all the agencies working have to understand that this isn't an issue that should be confined to the agencies that may have women and girls in their title, but it's every agency. You know, there's so much that can be done. For example, in terms of shelter, the way in which shelters are constructed, you know, are there areas which are dark at night where women have to go where they're vulnerable, or can you design things in a way that they're less vulnerable? So there's an awful lot that we can do, um, both through kind of some simple kind of ways of designing programs and also through specific initiatives to try and support women and girls who are at risk or who have suffered sexual violence. Uh, yeah, just on, just on that, um, uh, I would absolutely agree that we really don't know enough of, of what, what's actually happening uh, in, in Syria. Um, and, 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 and the truth will come out, fortune, unfortunately, long after uh, it should come out and uh, long after we, we, we might have been in a position to, to help alleviate some of the suffering. And I think it's particularly um, um, uh, pertinent to, to mention in this regard um, the fact that we know very, very little about what's going on um, uh, directly, no directly, very little about what's going on in places of detention in Syria. 
Um, uh, the ICRC, is, as well as being the, you know, the guardian of the Geneva Conventions, also has um, a mandate and responsibility to, to, to visit detainees um, in, in, in conflict. And, and, that's, uh, and, that's, uh, and we've been pressing the Syrian authorities to allow us to make these visits for a very long time now. Um, and we've and barring two visits to, to, to main prison establishments, uh, we have not been able to get access to the prisons and to the, the detainees uh, within Syria. And um, you know, and this would be worrying in any armed conflict, and particularly concerning uh, in Syria, uh, where we, we just really do not know enough about what's going on uh, in places of detention, where you know we know that tens of thousands are being of people are being kept. Um, uh, and, it, and, it's, and it's vital that we, we get access uh, to, to understand uh, the treatment uh, of, of detainees there. And on, on, on Chris's question, you know, that's, that's a big question, this issue of how to deal with factions. Um, you know, there's reams of studies on this. It's a problem worldwide. It's not just an issue in Syria. And, and you know, and there's a whole seminar to be done on that. I, you know, I don't know whether we can, I don't know that we can give you a quick and easy answer on that right now. Uh, we'll just hear from uh, Marwa first about your experience on the ground as well, dealing with uh, with women and locals. Um, how do you uh, assess the situation in terms of the violence against women and children? And then maybe we can uh, hear from uh, Emmanuel as well. Um, again, uh, with the situation with detainees, um, we haven't had much access. Um, and, and we haven't really, we've been focusing on other, sadly, Priorities um, in inverted commas, but everything is a priority in terms of um, in terms of our programs that we you know in terms of shelter um, with women where where we facilitate shelter for women we we always ensure that there is safe um, sort of um, secure sort of bathrooms um, you know where they can go to um, in the evening a, at night um, even when we're carrying out our visits we have a women uh, you know we have our field team who are predominantly men but we always also have um, a woman that comes um, with the, the men when we're doing the field assessments, so that these women feel safe, um, so that they're you know they aren't their you know their personal space and uh, and, and their rights aren't violated by you know by anyone. Um, sadly, the situation um, and the stories that we have um, encountered on the ground, especially in the north, are, are getting much much worse, even in Turkey um, and in. Um, and in Lebanon, um, in, in the areas where we've worked, we found that there is a lot of uh, gender violation internally, even with, within, the, within the refugee communities and even within the IDP communities. Um, what can we do? We can try and facilitate for families to have f family secure uh, accommodation. So each family is with its family unit as opposed to having women in, in one big room and, and, and men in, in one big room. That's causing uh, trouble and, and, and we've actually witnessed the, the, this, the problems as a result of that. So that what we're trying to do is establish is units where families can, can be together, um, where the father is, is there to have them all together. Um, and that's hopefully reducing the, 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 the violence, the gender violence um, that we encounter. Thank you, Marwa. Final thoughts from you, then, Marwa. Yes, it was in response to Chris's question about the fragmentation of, of, the, of the opposition. Oh, Sorry, um, fragmentation of the opposition that we're seeing in Syria and in many other contexts. Obviously, essential from an operational point of view to be able to engage with all of them to negotiate access in safety. And I think in in relation to that is a rather different type of challenge that some of these groups might be labelled as terrorist entities, and there might be states not involved, I mean, both the state involved in the conflict, but also donor states that might preclude any engagement with a terrorist entity, so which uh, further complicates um, the endeavors to reach out to them and carry out humanitarian operations. Thank you very much. I'm not sure if we have uh, more time for more questions, but final questions, uh, just one, one, one final one, please go ahead. Just going back to the point of the media, I, I was recently out in Syria, um, where we made a panorama saving Syria's children. Um, I was one of the doctors. I attended a, uh, an event last night that was run by um, Intelligence Squared and the journalist and photographer Paul Conroy was talking and he made a very important point. He, um, well someone also raised the question about media coverage and maybe we're not seeing enough. I think for the last two and a half years, journalists and media organisations have been taking huge risks to go to these places to show you pictures. I don't know 
how much more people want to see. Um, when the day we filmed, um, I, I myself was working in the hospital where we had up to 40 badly burnt teenagers and their family members when a school was hit by a thermal incendiary device. We thought, when we sat down and debriefed that day, we literally thought we'd witnessed, and, and uh, you know, our clothes were still covered um, in the smoke and debris from, from that day. Um, we thought, this is it. This is going to do something. This is going to make people act. And when I say people, I mean governments. I mean, DFID joining in to, to support local NGOs, the local NGOs that were running that hospital. But sadly, it's November, and that still hasn't happened. I don't know how many more pictures you need to see. Uh, my colleague David Knott is here. He actually was, was working in a hospital where his colleagues took a photograph and published a picture of, of a fetus with a bullet in its head. How many po more pictures do you need to see? Thank you very much. I think uh, we, we reached the, the end of our discussion today. It was uh, a very important talk. Uh, Sorry, you want to go ahead. Yeah, yeah I, I, I do think we need to respond to the, to the question because it's, 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 it's a vital one. Um, it, you know, what does it take to get a response? Um, so far, what we've seen is, is, is you need to conduct a chemical weapons attack. Okay, that gets a response. Um, um, so if you kill 1,400 people with chemical weapons, then the world is the world uh, stands up, pays attention, and and, and does something. Uh, but if you are engaged in in sort of uh, persistent conventional warfare, uh, which you know kills uh, 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 kids every day, um, um, you know that 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 is that is a, unfortunately uh, a status quo. But um, and you know we've had this issue of 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 of, how, of 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 what pictures does it take to kind of to 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 arouse public outrage um, in other conflicts before um, um, you know I reported on Bosnia and and and, and we were all we, we you know from massacre to massacre we wondered whether this would be the one that would that would that would cause um, you know a sort of collective uh, upswell of outrage and 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 and, and, and response and unfortunately it, it took too many. Um, I don't know where we are on, on the on the gauge in Syria. I also know that the, pol the, the you know the kind of geopolitics around Syria are extraordinarily difficult, um, and there and the 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 sort of the, the sort of ar array of forces um, um, ar 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 around the Syria question are so strong um, that that concerted international um, uh, response action is very hard to 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 achieve. That's desperately desperately sad. Um, uh, but it's the reality. Any more thoughts? Yes, I wanted to respond. Maybe you misunderstood my problem. I wasn't my 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 point. I wasn't blaming the media at all. I was blaming us, the humanitarians, in not sufficiently highlighting the humanitarian crisis. So not the protection crisis. What you're talking to me about are the consequences of a vicious armed conflict. I felt that perhaps we as humanitarians should do more to highlight the perhaps less graphic realities that there are people starving, that there are people who are unable to receive the medical assistance that they need to survive. So those two particular categories of really purely humanitarian assistance that get overlooked perhaps uh, on the, in view of the overall tragedy, but on which we could therefore have more concerted action if people were aware of this, because I feel that to some degree they are overshadowed by precisely the instances you describe. Uh, I, I was basically going, referring back to the, I think you made a point about broadcasters they focused on fighting. Um, um, and it was made by Marwa, maybe she me. has an answer. <laughs> Um, again, it's getting more and more deadly and dangerous for journalists to go in. Um, uh, we I could couldn't agree. I couldn't we agree keep more. Keep churning out the pictures, uh, but what's I mean, going to happen? The reality is, um, recently the the uh, the situation in the Philippines, um, and you have a stark contrast between the response between the situation in the Philippines. Yes, the Philippines was a natural disaster. Yes, Syria is uh, a man-made disaster. The response by the humanitarian actors. Um, the 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 planes that were flown out immediately the the immediate response by the humanitarian actors was hugely uh, different because I'd like to say and perhaps I'm a little biased they th yes they could do something about it um, but yes they pushed to do something about it but they wanted to do something about it 
because it puts into question humanitarian actors' uh, credibility. Syria, humanitarian actors can do something. We can all, as a community, come together to, to do something, to make change. And, and it's the role of the humanitarian actors and the media all together to, to sway public opinion and to, to make public opinion respond. The DEC response um, has been 63 million in, in less than two, 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 three, two to three weeks. The DEC response to the Syria crisis in over six months is, is only 23 million. We need to, to, to we can change uh, public opinion, and it's the role of the humanitarian actors to really highlight the humanitarian disaster. And, and perhaps that is a failure of us as a, as a humanitarian sector. That's another debate that we could probably um, have a little bit later. It's, it's all of us together. Um, have, I believe, failed miserably to um, to treat this, the, the situation in Syria as a humanitarian crisis and, and focus on the humanitarian disaster rather than focus on the on, on the, the sad continued armed conflict where the international community all has a stake uh, stake in there. So Matthew, I, I mean, I think on that particular question, I think Moira said it far more eloquently than I could, so I'll just uh, endorse what you said, Maria. And Ben, uh, any final thoughts, please? No, I, I, I really appreciated the discussion, and uh, it's uh, still a very discouraging feeling I go away with. Um, yes, we also thought, if only there were the, the Srebrenica moment, um, the political situation would change, and the Hule massacre, we thought at one point would do that. Clearly, this Syria is uh, sadly, tragically stuck in between some very large opposing forces, and, and that's uh, the reason why no end of hideous pictures will, will not uh, change the political uh, uh, calculus. Um, my, my going back to my point at the beginning, it's not that amateurs are better, but where amateurs can do, uh, you know, the international resources should surely um, be engineered in a way to help them when the, when the structured international uh, systems uh, cannot. Thank you. Thank you, Ben, and thank you very much uh, for being here with us today. It's an important topic to be discussed, and it's still ongoing crisis that uh, uh, unclear when it's going to uh, to end. And even if it ends tomorrow, it will take years and years and lots of efforts to uh, rebuild what has been destroyed. But right now, a huge action is needed, and more is needed uh, to help Syria uh, in its crisis. And the Syrian people uh, are in need and in need of your support. Thank you very much for being uh, with us here and thank you very much for the panelists for their great contribution today and uh, there will be a refreshment and if you want to uh, network with the panelists uh, please join us thank you very much <laughs>